So in this portion of the talk, we're going to talk about the use of ultrasound to evaluate for deep venous thrombosis or DVTs. And this is a rel relatively common uh, thing that will present to the emergency department. And really in the, what you see in the course of the history of events, you'll have some risk factors that may cause um, the DVT to happen or some inciting event that causes the DVT to happen. And what we really don't want to see, but what can happen is this thing can embolize and become a pulmonary embolism or PE, which has significant consequences for the patient, both in morbidity, but also poten in potential mortality. And so from a clinical perspective, patients are going to present with things like leg pain or leg swelling or some erythema. Um, and from an exam standpoint, we may be looking for things like, well, tenderness to the leg, but also edema or unilateral edema, maybe a palpable cord. Uh, if you want to measure the difference in the calf size, there may be some palpable or some, some measurable difference there. Uh, but all these things are really going to be challenging to get to the diagnosis, right? If, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of overlap between this and other entities. And so we need to add some other thing to help us get to the diagnosis. And what's been proposed in the past is this Wells score to kind of help risk stratify who's at risk for a DVT. Uh, and as we can see, the Wells score really doesn't perform all that well with the 75% sensitivity and 55% specificity. And so it's really going to be, uh, we're going to really have to add some extra data on top of this to, to really get to this diagnosis, whether it be a D-dimer uh, in certain circumstances, but also some imaging in, in other circumstances. And that's kind of where we're going to go with the rest of this talk. So from an imaging standpoint, there are a myriad of options that you can choose from. We can do contrast venography, CT venography, MRI, impedance plasmathography, and all of these are potential ways of getting to the diagnosis, but they all have significant limitations in that they take the, part, the patient away from the department, they may be invasive, they may involve radiation, they may be very time intensive. Um, and so we really need to find something that's going to be that we can do, especially in critical patients that can be done uh, in the department, that can be done reproducibly, and it can be done, you know, really much pretty much at the bedside. And so enter ultrasound is the idea or the ideal option for how we can work these patients up to look for the or look for a DVT in the lower extremity. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk a little bit about the vascular anatomy that we're going to run across. We're going to talk a little bit about the scanning technique that we're going to utilize to do this. And we're going to talk a little bit about pitfalls that we may encounter in the workup of these patients. So from a vascular anatomy standpoint, if we take the body, right, strip away the skin, we're left with some muscles and a whole bunch of other tissue here. And what we see is the vascular structures exit the, the abdomen and the pelvis as they travel underneath the inguinal canal and they come into the leg, right? And so we can strip away some of these structures here and we can see that all we're left with at the end is an artery and a vein, right? So we have the femoral artery and the femoral vein in the leg. And really the two mirror one another. They do very similar things. And so the artery always leads the vein and the vein will always follow the artery in terms of what happens. So if we talk about the artery first, we see the, the common femoral artery uh, exiting the inguinal canal into the, into the leg compartment and it's going to bifurcate. And it's going to bifurcate into the femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. And those, the, those continue to travel down the leg. The deep femoral artery goes deep into the leg. The femoral artery travels down the medial aspect of the leg towards the knee. The vein, on the other hand, does something very similar. It exits the inguinal canal, becomes the common femoral vein. But the one unique exception is that it has the addition of the greater saphenous vein on the medial aspect. So the greater saph drains the medial aspect of the leg, and it comes up that leg and joins the common femoral vein before the femoral vein bifurcates into the superficial and the deep components. So after the greater saphenous vein happens, we're going to see a bifurcation of that femoral vein. So let's, let's look at this a little bit further. We see here on the left, the sonographic image, and we see here on the right, the schematic image. So if we look here is in this upper segment, we can we see the jun junction of the greater saphenous vein to the common femoral vein. If you look on the left side of the ultrasound image, you can see that almost like an elephant trunk coming in on the left side of that vein. And if you look on the other side of that large vein, there's two structures, um, right? Right about there, you can see the bifurcation of that femoral artery. So at the upper portion, you see it is a common femoral artery, and then it bifurcates into that, that femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. Moving to the next segment, we're going to see the bifurcation of the femoral vein uh, as it travels down the leg. So here we see uh, the femoral artery on the left-hand side of the screen. The deep system is kind of moving away. And then we have the compressible common femoral vein and it's going to bifurcate into the femoral vein and the deep femoral vein. So we can see almost that stop sign or that snowman appearance uh, as it bifurcates into the 
femoral vein and the deep femoral vein system. And then moving down to the, the rest of the leg, we see the femoral artery on top right, and the femoral vein, that compressible femoral vein beneath it, and it really is just two vascular structures that we need to follow for the vast majority of patients. Now, there can be a small subset of patients who have a bifurcated femoral vein system, and you need to be careful and look out for that, but most patients will just have a single femoral artery and a single femoral vein at this area. And we're really just going to follow this down the leg as we approach the knee, and that's the zone there. Now, as we go towards the knee, the the artery and the vein are going to travel more medially and they're going to go to the posterior aspect of the leg as it travels through Hunter's Canal. And when it goes posterior to the knee, it becomes the popliteal artery and the popliteal vein. So if we look on the ultrasound image here, this is a still image, but we can see the, the single artery and the single vein as we look at the proximal portion of the popliteal fossa. And as we move more distally, this popliteal vein is going to branch into multiple different branches going to the lower leg. Now, interesting thing to note is now that we're looking at the posterior aspect of the leg, we've changed the probe orientation. So where we saw the artery more superficial and the vein more deep on the anterior aspect of the leg, when we look in the popliteal fossa, we're going to see the popliteal vein to be more superficial and the popliteal artery to be a little bit deeper. So let's talk a few minutes about scanning technique, how we're going to scan these patients. So we want to choose the high frequency linear transducer for most patients. This is going to give us a high resolution image. And in patients who don't have a ton of subcutaneous tissue in their thigh, this is going to work perfectly fine. Now, a lot of patients tend to have a lot of subcutaneous adipose tissue in their thigh. And so if you need more penetration to get down to where the veins are, uh, you may need to trans transition yourself to the, the curvilinear transducer to really capitalize on that low frequency uh, penetration uh, that that probe can give us. But what we're going to lose is we're going to lose some resolution as we're changing down to a lower frequency. So you want to position your patient in the semi-fowler's position or the reverse Trendelenburg, basically get their head their head up a little bit below or above the level of their legs so you can allow gravity to pull some of that blood down into the vessels and distend those vessels a little bit. You want to externally rotate the patient's legs so you can open up that inguinal canal area where the patient has the artery and the vein traveling. And you want to use for the probe, the probe marker towards the patient's right, our typical convention, right? You want to identify vessels and then start from the inguinal ligament and scan all the way down from the inguinal ligament down through the popliteal fossa doing compression uh, at every several centimeters just to make sure that you have patency of the vein. So how do we do this, right? What methods do we use? The first one is B-mode compression, and you can also use color Doppler to give you some additional information. Although B-mode compression will be the primary modality that we're going to use to identify for DVTs. So B-mode compression. Basically, a vein is going to have several characteristics. It's going to be anechoic, right? It's going to be thin-walled, and it's going to be compressible. Now, you have to be careful in a hypotensive patient, you may notice that the artery is also anechoic and compressible. So be on the alert for the different vascular structures, but the artery will tend to have a thicker wall as we see here. So what we have is on the right, we see a large vein, right, the anechoic thin walled vein. And just next to it, we see a thicker walled uh, arterial structure. Now, when you do, when you compress this, when you press the the thigh with the probe, you should see complete coaptation of the walls of the vein. You should see it completely collapse and, and be obliterated with your pressure. Now, in order to do this uh, on patients who have a little bit thicker thighs, you may need to move your other hand posterior on their thigh and kind of compress the vein between the probe and your other hand. But what you should see is you should see complete collapse of the walls of the vein when you pro provide compression. And when you do that, then you know that there is no DVT at that point, right? Doesn't tell you anything about anywhere else in the system. You have to look there, but at that point, there is no DVT there. So here's an example of a DVT. This is actually in long axis. So you can see the artery on top and the, the vein on the bottom. And what you're gonna notice is that you're gonna have some echogenic material within the wall or within the, the vein, right? And if you press on this, it's gonna be, be non-compressible. You're not gonna be able to compress that DVT away. And so that's gonna be the, the hallmark of what you're looking for to identify the presence of a DVT.
Here's another example of a DVT in short axis. This one is not a clip, this is just a still, but you can see in the right hand structure, there's some echogenic material with inside the lumen of that vein. And so as you identify these veins, what you wanna look for is violations of those rules. Remember we said the vein is anechoic, it's thin walled and it's compressible. So if you see some echogenic material within the vein, right, and it prevents complete compression of the walls of that vein, then that should alert you to the fact that there's a DVT present. Now, one thing you may notice is that you can see some echogenic flow within a vein, right? If you have slow flow, uh, it may appear slightly echogenic. Now, if you compress this, it will be completely compressible and therefore indicate that this is not a DVT, but just rather slow flow. So this looks very distinct from what we saw earlier with that, that formed clot that was in the, the vein in the long axis a couple slides ago. We can also add color Doppler to assist us in the diagnosis of making it of a DVT. And really the principle here is the same as the principle of using contrast in a CT scan to look for a PE and that is looking for a filling defect. And so if you add color Doppler to the patient's blood vessel, you can see you should see complete filling of that blood vessel. And so here we see a still image of the artery on top, right? We see filling of that artery and we see lack of filling in the vein below it with the echogenic material with inside the vein. And if we go to a long axis view of a DVT, uh, we can see on top, we have complete filling of the artery, the pulsatile filling. And you can see kind of this rhythmic filling around the DVT in the vein uh, as the blood is flowing you know, throughout that vein. And we don't have complete filling. We have that filling defect indicating the DVT. Now, there's a lot of pitfalls with this and that you have to make, to make sure you get your Doppler settings just right so that you don't overbleed on top of a DVT. But this can be an additional way to augment your understanding of the DVT to make sure that or to see if it's there. So finally, let's talk about a few pitfalls in the evaluation for a DVT. First one is lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are common things that you'll find up in the inguinal area of the thigh, right? They tend to be rounded, they tend to be echogenic, and they can mimic the appearance of a DVT in short axis. The difference between the lymph node and the DVT sonographically is that when you turn the, the transducer into a long axis view, you'll continue to have this oval-shaped, rounded structure rather than a linear structure that you'd expect to see with a DVT. You can throw color on it, that can help as well. If you see some arborization inside, uh, that can also indicate that there's gonna be the presence of a lymph node. But basically here we have the long axis view uh, and the, the shape doesn't, doesn't appreciably change. Uh, so this suggests the, the presence of a lymph node. The second pitfall is inappropriate color Doppler settings, whether it be pulse repetition frequency or the color gain. If we have the color gain set way too high, we have bleed over of the wall, which would obscure the presence of a DVT. So you need to turn that color gain down so that the color is contained within the walls of the vessel. So this is another example of a pitfall. Here we see multiple anechoic thin walled structures that suggest the presence of a vein, but it's kind of confusing what the anatomy is. So if we put color on here, we can see that we have pulsatile turbulent flow suggesting a pseudo aneurysm in this patient's leg. And so this brings up the idea that we really need to be careful with the landmarks of the, the arteries and the veins and really identify positively the femoral artery and the femoral vein as we look through the patient's anatomy. Once you've identified positively those structures, then you can see the presence of abnormal structures around it.